add the number the jet decorator on it, and it only optimizes that function, or those functions, if you have many of them. It's, uh, the nice thing with that is that it allows us to react the semantics. That means we are not bound to, uh, to Python's usual sem semantics. We can cheat a bit, and we cheat actually quite a bit in order to optimize your code. Um, but also, your high-level code around that, all your classes and meta classes and so on, they can still use all kinds of uh, complicated things that Numba doesn't support, but it's not a problem. Because since they are, they are exec executed in the regular Python environments, then Numba doesn't care. So, as I said, specialized, so really, well, right now it's specialized for number crunch crunching. It's uh, really, uh, uh, how to say, it's tailored for NumPy arrays. That is, NumPy array is the dominant data type in scientific computing. It has a lot of features, and we try to uh, support them. And a bunch of other things. So we are slowly trying to extend the range of things that we support, but still right now it's more or less specialized in number crunching. So the main target is the CPU. We officially support x86 and x86-64. Uh, ideally, LLVM provides us with support for many other uh, architectures. And we also have a, a target for NVIDIA GPUs using CUDA. So this means you write Python code and you can execute it on the GPU, but with a limited feature set because there's some there are some limitations on what you can do on a GPU, of course. There isn't a real runtime. You, you will be able to do memory allocation, but it will be quite slow. And the allocated memory will run in, uh, in the GPU's global memory, which is not very fast. We also have potential support for other architectures, thanks to LLVM. So one of my colleagues tried a number on the Raspberry Pi, and it actually works. Um, but we don't support it officially. Uh, I think LLVM takes several hours to compile. We have some support going on for HSA, which is uh, something by AMD called, uh, it means heterogeneous system architecture. It's an architecture uh, for what they call APUs. So the goal is to blend the programming model between GPUs and CPUs. You write uh, one, one implementation and it can run um, either simul simul simultaneously on the GPU or CPU, or you, you can run it on either of them. And supposedly there's well, some memory sharing and so on. Uh, let's talk a bit about the architecture. So number, if you compare it to other jets, is quite straightforward. It's not very exciting. It works one function at a time, uh, which is a, it's a constraint we, which we're gonna relax because we need to relax it in order to support recursion. But right now it's one function at a time. It starts from the Python bytecode. So we don't have a parser, we just use the bytecode emitted by CPython. And we have a compilation and analysis chain which transform, transforms it slowly uh, across various steps to LLVM IR. So LLVM IR, it's LLVM's internal representation. Uh, it's a kind of, let's say it's a portable assembly and it allows you to specify a lot of things. Uh, the difference with C, for example, is that you really can specify some behaviors in a very uh, granular way. For example, you can specify if uh, there's some, if signed overflow on integers is well, well defined or undefined. If you have, for example, in this example, if you have undefined behavior on sing, uh, signed integers overflow, then it allows LVM to do further optimizations. So after the LLVM IR is shipped to LLVM, everything is delega delegated to LLVM, LLVM itself, included low-level optimizations and also executed in the function. And on top of that, we also generate some Python facing wrappers because we, uh, each function gets a low-level implementation which takes some native types, and you have to marshal those from and to Python objects. So this is the compilation pipeline. Uh, you see there are, there are two entry points there. You can see the uh, wavy arrows. So the first entry point is the Python bytecode itself, as I said. Uh, we have uh, an analysis chain from the bytecode. Uh, first, the bytecode is analyzed and uh, we build a control flow graph, a data flow graph, uh, and we uh, produce something which is called number IR. Uh, so number's own intermediate representation, which is 
quite as high level as bytecode, but it's a bit different. It's, it's not a stack machine. It's based on values. And the second entry point is when you, the function is actually called. When a function is actually called, uh, we record the types of the values, and we do type inference over the, the, those values. We try to propagate all the types across the function. Uh, I'm going to talk about the number types just after. It's, uh, much more com it's a bit more complicated than just mapping some classes to some types, because it, we have more granular typing in number than in, in Python. After the type inference pass, there's a, a, a pass uh, which deals with rewriting the IR. So it's an optional pass which does some optimizations. The next pass is lowering. Uh, lowering is a LLVM. Uh, it's from the LLVM jargon. It's, it means that you take a high-level language, which is known as IR, and you lower it to something very low level, which in this case is LLVM IR. And then, then we ship everything to LLVM, to the LLVM JIT, which produces machine code, and we execute it. So there is a, a, small, um, a small rectangle named cache, which is grayed out because it's not implemented yet, but ideally we, we will be able to cache either the machine code or the LLVM IR in order to have faster compilation times. So number types, as I said, the number type system is more granular and more precise than, than the Python type system. Uh, we have several integer types based on the, uh, depending on the bitness, on the sineness. We have uh, single precision and double precision floating point types. We have uh, tuples are typed, which means that you don't have a single tuple type. You have a different tuple type for every, uh, for every kind of parameter that's in the tuple. So, Tuples are typed based on the uh, each element's number type. So you have a different uh, type or type, for example, for uh, a pair of int and float 64, for a pair of float 64 and float 32, and so on. Uh, NumPy array themselves, so they are a very important type, uh, part of, uh, of, n of number and of, uh, and of scientific computing. Uh, they are typed according to the uh, dimensionality and to their contiguousness. Um, so, the lowering pass is uh, what really uh, takes the uh, type inferred uh, number IR and it uh, transforms it into LLVM code, LLVM IR. So, this is very straightforward and not very exciting part, but it has a lot of code because we implement a lot of functions. We implement all the operators, we implement uh, math functions, and so on. And if we are careful enough with what we generate, we can allow LLVM to inline and do other optimizations here. So, what's supported? Uh, number supports a real uh, small, rather small subset of Python, at least. On the syntax field, uh, on the syntax front, it supports quite a bit, but not all. It supports uh, all control flow routines or constructs. It supports raising exceptions, but not catching them. It supports calling other compile functions. Uh, we have recent support for generators, but only the simple kind of generators. That is not, that, not those to which you can send values, not coroutines, but just uh, um, syntactic iterators with a uh, yield keyword. So what don't we support? We don't support, well, all the rest. We don't support uh, exception catching code. We don't support context managers. We don't support comprehensions. And actually, we don't support lists and sets and dicts yet, although it will certainly come. And we don't support yield from. Um, as for the built-in types and functions, we, we have support for most types which are useful for, compute, for scientific computing. So all the numeric types, uh, integers, floats, and so on. Tuples and known, which are quite basic. And we have support for the buffer protocol, which means that you can you can address, uh, you can index over bytes, byte arrays, memory views, and everything which supports the, by, the, the buffer protocol, which also includes, for example, memory mapped files using the MMAP module. We have support for a bunch of built-in functions, and we have support for most operators, but of course only on the types that we support, so all the numeric types. We, we are able to optimize uh, several of the uh, standard library modules, so mostly those which are specialized for 
uh, numeric computing, so CMath and math, of course. We have support for uh, random number generation. We actually use the, the same algorithm as CPython, so the Merson and Twister, except that we have a, a separate state. Uh, we have support for C types, which means you can call uh, row C functions from number code, which, which is a cheap way of actually calling uh, C libraries, and it generates very fast code because it calls it from a native context. Similarly, we support CFFI, which is just a replacement for C types most of the time, and we support mostly NumPy, um, at least a large subset of NumPy. So it's, what we support in NumPy is really the object of a whole page in the documentation, so I'm not really... Uh, I'm documenting, uh, wait, I'm, telling, I'm, I'm talking a bit about it here. Uh, we support uh, most kinds of arrays in NumPy, so most dimensionalities from 0D to ND. We support uh, arrays of various D types, so scalar arrays, numbers, and so on, structured arrays. Uh, we support uh, arrays with subarrays in them. The only thing we don't support, and we won't support in a long time, I think, is arrays containing Python objects because the whole point of NumPy is, is to generate native code which doesn't go through the CPython API. Uh, we have recently added support for constructors, so we can do memory allocation, allocate memory for number functions. Various operations on arrays, such as iterating, indexing, slicing, so there are various kinds of iterators we support, such as the dot flat operator and more or less fancy ones. We have support for reductions, so the products, uh, cumulative sums, and so on. On the scalar types front, we support daytime 64 and time delta 64, which are uh, weird and I think little known types which allow you to do low level computations on some daytimes and time deltas. And we support numpy.random num in the same way that we support the random module. So the limitations, uh, apart from what we don't support in terms of syntax, uh, in terms of syntax and in terms of, uh, of types, we don't support recursion. So that's because we're compiling one function at a time and we'll have to, uh, LV to, uh, to change that. We can't compile classes. Um, again, that's because we compile one function at a time, so we don't have a way of specifying an, a structure and a several methods operating on a, on a, on a user-defined type. And the other limitation is that type, type inference is, uh, is really has to, to, to succeed. So if a type of inference pass fails to uh, infer a type for a given variable, then the whole compilation fails. Ideally, we, we would have a way to say, well, uh, this is a Python object, but the rest is still inferred, so we'll, we will be able to bridge it. But right now, this is not possible. And actually, when type inference fails, it goes into a mode called object mode, which is not very interesting as far as performance is concerned. So, as I said, the fact that it's opt-in, it allows us to relax the semantics. So, as you have understood, perhaps, it has fixed, fixed size integers up to 64 bits. So, for example, if you're having an addition over two integers and the result overflows, then you've just seen a truncated result. You don't have an overflow or anything. We, we take the liberty of freezing the global and outer variables, so we uh, consider them constants, which is, uh, it makes it much easier to, to compile, and it allows us to have, it allows us to generate uh, more optimized code. For example, if you have math.py, then usually math.py won't change, so it's only fair to consider it a constant. But of course, if in your module you have a global variable whose value changes, then uh, you, you won't see it in your compiled function, it will keep the order value. So we don't have any frame introspection. Basically, we don't have any debugging features right now, uh, neither from the C level nor from the Python level. So this is something which, at least at the C level, we're going to, going to work on it because we want to, uh, we want to expose the names of uh, JIT functions to LLVM so that you can fire some JDB and have uh, a nice traceback. So how to use it? So basically, the, the, main, the main way to use it is to use the JIT decorator. It's very simple, so you have a function, and you just uh, tag the decorator on it, and hopefully it will be able to compile it. So the default way is not to pass any argument to the JIT decorator, and it will lazy co lazily compile the function. This means that it will wait for the function to be called, and it will do the type inference thing at this point, and it will, be, it will generate the, uh, the native code, and since you're calling the function, it will call the native code on the fly. And there's another way to call it, which is to manually specialize the arguments. Uh, let's say you, you really know you have some 
you want some 32 bit ins and you want some double precision floats or some single precision floats. And so you, have, you, you are able to pass uh, an explicit signature to number.jet. But this is not really recommended. It's mostly for us to test. So there's an option to remove the gear, which is quite easy for us since we are not calling it any CPython API from the generated native code. So you just pass no gear equals true, and the gear will be removed. So the gear is a global interpreter lock. For those who don't know, it's a, it's a lock which constrains CPython execution to a single thread. If, re if you remove the gear, you can call your function or your functions from several threads and have a parallel execution on several cores. But of course, you have no protection from these conditions, so you are in the same position as a C++, a C++ programmer who has to uh, be careful about uh, not uh, having several threads accessing the same data and mutating it, for example. As a tip, instead of having your own thread pool, you just use concurrent futures on Python 3. Another feature is the vectorized decorator. So NumPy has something called a universal function. Uh, to explain what a universal function is, uh, it's better to take an example. So if, if you take the plus operator between arrays, for example, which is a shortcut to the np.add function, the np.add function um, is basically doing an element-wise operation on all em elements of its input. And the way it's implemented is really to have a loop on the element-wise operation internally. And then the nice thing with a universal function is that you have several additional features. There's something called broad broadcasting in NumPy. So if you are adding, for example, a scalar, an array, actually the scalar which be, will be added to each element in the array. So really the, the lower dimensional argument is broadcast, broad broadcasted onto the higher dimensional argument. So this is handled automatically by the UFunk framework and the, uh, the inner loop doesn't have to, to care about that. And it also gives you for free some reduction methods, so you have some reduce and accumulation functions. So NumPy comes with a fixed set of universal, universal functions, so add, multiplication, square root, and so on. Uh, traditionally, if you want to add a universal function, write your own, you have to code in C. So you write your inner loop in C with a specific C API provided by NumPy. You compile it against the right NumPy version, and you get your universal function, so it's not it's not very convenient for users, and the users don't do that. So using number, you can write the element-wise function in pure Python, and you can put the vectorized decorator on it, and it will generate the UFunk. Another, yeah, another more sophisticated feature of NumPy is a generalized universal function. So this is an extension of the idea of a universal function. A uh, universal function works on one element at a time. It doesn't see the neighbors of the rest of your arrays. A generalized universal function, you can see the whole arrays, and you have to specify um, ex exactly uh, what the layout of the inputs are. So it's, it allows for some more sophisticated functions, such as a moving average. So num number also allows you to generate a uh, general generalized universal function using the geo-vectorized decorator. So here is an example. It's called the uh, Ising model. So it's something which is used apparently mainly for benchmarking, but it's inspired from some physics model. The, the basic idea is that you have a, a two-degree, uh, two-dimension grid of Boolean states. Um, either Boolean or binary states, and you can think of it as each element have a, having either a value uh, plus one or minus one, and it starts from a random state, basically, and at each iteration, you make each element vary based upon its neighbors. So at the end, it's supposed to converge towards some, something which is quite stable. So this was generated with number, this animation. So if you look at how it looks like, well, you have an inner function which processes each, uh, each element in the array and which updates it based on its neighbor's value. So there are, there are a couple of operations. It takes its neighbor's value, uh, combines it with the actual value of the element, and it takes a decision based on that and a random, uh, a random number. And the uh, outer loop is just looping over the whole array, and it's updated, it updates all elements. 
So the outer loop which we see in update one frame, it does one iteration. And then if you want to uh, make the model converge, you have to call it a number of times. So if you measure that, well, you get uh, 100 times speed up for number over C Python, uh, which is less than you, than you get with Fortran. But still, it's within range. It's, in this case, it's twice, twice lower. And we know why, actually, because uh, array indexing in Python is more sophisticated. Uh, for example, well, the main reason is that if you, uh, Python allows negative array indexing, you know that if you uh, have a negative index, you are indexing from the end, so you have to have a runtime check of uh, the negativeness of each number. And in some cases, LRVM isn't able to optimize it out. So besides that, we have QLA support, as I said. So the main uh, API for that is the QLA.jet decorator. It's, uh, so we don't try to hide the QLA programming model. Uh, the QLA programming model is based on the, the notion of a grid of threads. So you have blocks of threads and you have a grid of blocks. And the, the GPU executes all those threads in parallel, more or less. But you have to tell the GPU which is the topology of threads. Um, and besides that, there are two types of functions. There are kernel functions, which are called from a CPU, actually. So a kernel function is not able to return a value. You pass it some arrays, some input arrays, some output arrays, which are marshaled automatically by number to the GPU. And you write the results in the array from the GPU. And there's something called device functions, which are really sub-functions, and they are called from the GPU to the GPU. So these ones can return values. When you're using the QLA support in number, you have a limited array of features because, as I said, the, uh, you, you don't have a, a large runtime available on the GPU. So it also requires the programmer to have not only some, non some knowledge of QLA and how a GPU works, but also to have some intuition of how to optimize the code for execution on the GPU because it's not usually, you, you're not usually um, arranging your, your, algorithm in the, your algorithm in the same way on the GPU or on the CPU especially except in trivial cases. So here is an example. It's a very simple example, this one, it's just to show you how it works. Uh, we are trying to uh, compute the cosine of an array. So we're using the QDA digit decorator. We have a function which takes two arguments. The first argument is, a, is the input array. The second argument is the output array. So it's, there is no convention. It's just a choice here, for example. Uh, we must, the idea is that each GPU thread which compute will compute one value over the array. So it will take one element in the array and compute the cosine and put it in the, in the output array. So the, fir the first thing is that you are computing the index. So co to compute the index of a current thread, you call the QDOT grid function. And then you have to uh, just call math.cos on the input and write it in the output. So this is the definition. Then you want to call it. Uh, you have to, so GPU, of course, defines the GPU function. Then you want to instantiate the kernel, actually. And it's instantiated the kernel means that you, uh, you define the grid topology. So this is the thread config here. It's a two-element tuple, um, two tuple. The first element is the number of um, blocks in the grid, I think, and the second number is the number of threads in, the, in each block. So you define the topology based on the length and the output, and you call the GPU cost function with that topology and the, on the input and output. So, well, in this example, the numbers are better on the GPU, but it's not very important because you, won't, you wouldn't use a GPU just to, uh, to compute a cosine. You will do something more complex. So if you want to install number, uh, since it's open source, you can compile it from scratch if you want. But you have to compile LLVM and a specific version of it because LLVM tends, uh, has backwards and compatible changes in each uh, feature release. So the current version of number requires LLVM 3.6. And you will have to fetch LLVM 3.6 compiled for your platform or get, if you can get them, some uh, binary development packages. And then you have to compile LLVM Lite with a sufficiently uh, recent C++ compiler, which is not, not trivial at all. So we, we really recommend you use Conda which is, uh, which is uh, Continuum's own package manager. So it's an open source, uh, an open source package manager. And it, has, uh, and it comes to with, uh, with a default uh, distribution of binary packages called Anaconda. And if you have Conda, you just type can Conda install number and you have it on your platform. So 
Uh, let's wrap up. Uh, so you can find the documentation on the web. Uh, we have, of course, a GitHub account with your code and issue tracker. You are very welcome to come to a number of users mailing list, either as a user or as, or as a pot potential contributor. Uh, I must also mention that Numba is commercially supported by Continuum Analytics, so if you want to uh, buy consulting enhancements, uh, support for some architectures, uh, you can write to sales at Continuum.io. And there's a last thing called Number Pro, which is an extension, a proprietary extension to Numba, which provides uh, bindings to some specialized libraries for, uh, for the GPU. Um, various uh, scientific specialized libraries, and it also has, uh, I think it has extensions to allow it to parallelize the code easier on the CPU. So that's it. So two questions about your use of LLVM. First, um, it sounded like you supported only a subset of all the platforms that LLVM supports. Why is it that you don't just have the same support requirements and platform list as LLVM? Uh, what did you say? We support a subset of what? Do you, do you support everything that LLVM sub supports, or do you only support uh, a you couple? You mean as architectures? Yes. Uh, it's a matter of validation, because ideally it works, but who knows what it will give um, actually, you know? Okay. Okay, and I was also wondering, um, a couple of years ago, an attempt to marry CPython and LLVM uh, together called Unladen Swallow. Yeah. Uh, I was wondering if, like, nothing ultimately came of it and Unladen Swallow died, but I was wondering if the work that they had done was helpful at all in the development of Numba. I don't think so, well, not directly. Uh, when at, the, at the time, they said that they had helped uh, LLVM improve the support for JIT compilers, so perhaps indirectly it benefited. But we, did, we didn't take anything from them because we use, the, we use our own wrapper run LLVM called LLVM Lite. And then Numba is pure Python. Uh, the big difference with Unladen Swallow is that Unladen Swallow did everything in C++, which I think was a very, um, uh, I mean, it's necessary if you want to uh, compile very fast, but it's also much less flexible. So pure Python allows us to experiment and uh, develop very quickly. I have uh, three questions. Yeah. First question is, does a number compile do the JIT compiling in a separate thread? No, it's in the same thread. So you actually have to wait for the compilation to finish before it gets fast? Yeah, well, what will you, what will you do anyway? Oh, you mean when you, because it's lazily compiling, so if it's compiling when you're calling the function, anyway, you must wait for it. Yeah, of course, but I mean, it, well, anyway. Sometimes in some JIT compilers, they do it in a separate thread, and then it just continues with a slow version until it's done. Oh, right. No, we don't do that. OK. Uh, second one is, uh, do you have any support for storing the compiled code? For? For storing the compiled oh, code on Oh, not disk? yet. No, as I said, we, we want to support caching, but not yet. So that's what you meant with caching. So you're yeah. actually not like PyPy, which has the, the problem that it cannot store the compiled version? I'm not sure if PyPy does that. Okay. So they have to redo it every time you run the code. So yeah. it would be more efficient if you just do it once and then store it and then yes, just fetch it. Yes, of course, it. yeah. But that's uh, an, obvious way, an, ob an obvious thing to add. But right now, we don't have it. Okay. And the uh, third one is, how do you do error handling? Because you said you don't have any way to catch exceptions. Yeah, so we have a way to raise them. So if you raise an exception for number code, then you just catch in when it goes outside of a number code. So you, you can communicate. You can communicate errors to the user, but you can't handle it in the number code. And maybe an extra question. Um, so you support, so you're working for, to, for the support of NumPy. Do you plan also to support SciPy? Are there some plans for that? Or? Uh, not yet. We mostly support NumPy right now. So every kind of pure Python code which relies on NumPy arrays may be perhaps accelerated if it, uh, if it intersects with a subset of things we support. But we don't have direct support for anything other than NumPy right now. I suppose we, uh, someday we want to support Pandas. Yeah. Uh, we have no more time for questions. Okay. So thank you.